What's going on? Welcome back to the channel. We are driving to Jiu Jitsu right now. It's been a couple weeks since I finished my mini cut and uh, I have not gained all the weight back. I've actually I've lost another pound. Um, but in this video, what we're going to talk about is how to develop a healthy relationship with food. So let's get into it. Just finished up with jujitsu. It is uh, time to head home and see my wife and baby. All right, so in a previous video, I asked if you'd like me to talk about how to build a healthy relationship with food, and there was a resounding, overwhelmingly positive response of yes, please talk about that. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Thank you to everyone who did reply in the comments. We do read all of them, myself and Mitch, who's behind the camera. Mitch, let's put your Instagram right here so people can go follow you. Um, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about how to build a healthy relationship with food. I'm gonna go through all of this, but what I wanna talk about first, boredom eating, sugar cravings, and extreme hunger. How do you deal with boredom eating? How do you deal with sugar cravings? And how do you deal with extreme hunger? If you're watching this being like, yes, like I definitely deal with at least one of those things. I know, I know. So many people struggle with these things. I get messages about these three things every single day. And the reason I'm covering them last is because I want you to watch the whole fucking video. So please do not skip this shit just to get to the one that you want because this shit will probably help you as well as what I'm gonna talk about in these individual sections, okay? So first and foremost, let's talk about my story. If you wanna skip this, you're welcome to. This is just gonna be me talking about me. Um, I just wanna give you some context and my background in terms of my relationship with food so you can understand where I'm coming from. This isn't even about my educational background. This is more just like what I went through personally. So growing up, Grew up in a family that you know was very academic and very smart. Uh, not myself, I was in special education. I was not good in school at all. But despite the like how smart my family is and all of that, they did not have much education around nutrition and it really wasn't something that they, they cared about very much. Nutrition, health, fitness, it just really wasn't part of my family at all. Um, everyone in my family has really struggled with their weight. Whereas for me, I was actually the only one who's never really struggled with that. And my mom loves to tell stories about how when, when uh, I was a little kid, like so little, like I, I couldn't even be thinking about food quality or, or, or weight or any of that. I'd go to a birthday party and they'd be handing out um, plates of cake to all the kids. And I just didn't want it. And even to this day, it's just because I don't like cake. Ice cream cake is a different story. Ice cream cake, that's a separate genre of cake. I fucking love ice cream cake. But if there was a choice between cake and fruit, I would choose fruit every time. My favorite fruit of all time, watermelon, I would eat that instead of cake. And my mom would always be like, you are the only child in the world who doesn't like cake. And it was just, that was just me. Like I loved, I never had an issue eating fruits. I never had an issue eating vegetables. It was just like, I enjoyed them and I understand I'm super lucky and very blessed that like I actually enjoy those things. But for me, that's just I what I what I liked. Whereas everyone else in my family was not the same at all. Now, there were times in my life where uh, even like eating a lot of fruit, like I would eat a lot of fruit. And I remember one time specifically, and I wanna make this very clear, my mom is amazing. I love my mom, she's incredible. Is the absolute best mom in the world, no doubt about it. I remember vividly one time I was eating a lot of fruit and my mom just said, you should be careful because there's a lot of sugar. And it's one of those things thinking back now, it's like, if my daughter is eating a lot of fruit, the last thing I'm gonna say is like, be careful, there's a lot of sugar, right? But that's just because I have the knowledge I've gained over these years. But there were comments made about food as I was eating, even when I was eating high quality food that I'll, I'll always remember, they sort of stick with you, right? Um, but very basically, very fortunately throughout my childhood, no issues with food, no issues with my weight. I felt very, very good. Um, then I started wrestling at around eight years old and 
There were no issues with food then, but by the time I got to high school and I had to cut weight, I was cutting from about 112 pounds to 103 pounds every week. This is when food became an issue for me. And when I say an issue, I mean it became a big fucking issue. Uh, severe disordered eating, severe binge eating, uh, severe anorexia, and there was some bulimia involved as well, just to be very honest with you. Now, I have an entire video covering how I got over my binge eating disorder. So what we'll do is we'll link that in the, sh in the description of this video. We'll put like how I overcame my binge eating disorder. Uh, if you want to watch the whole story of wrestling and how I developed binge eating issues and all the things that came with it, I'm not gonna go into detail here because it's a long video in and of itself, but I really, struggled with binge eating for many, many years, from about 14 years old until about like 20, 21 years old. It was a severe, severe problem for me. So there was that timeline. Then I was able to stop binge eating, which again, how I did that is in a, a separate video, which we'll link in the description of this video. And then from there, things just got exponentially better where I, at this point, I'm 31 years old. I think the last time I binged, I was like 20 or 21 years old and since then, I've had a very, very healthy relationship with food. And as Mitch and I were talking about this video, like, like what, what defines a healthy relationship with food? Like what is a healthy relationship with food? I think a lot of it is based on your individual goals, for sure, just like everything. Everything is based on your individual goals. But I also think there is objectively healthy and unhealthy relationships with food. For example, we all know and understand now that physical health is obviously very, very important, but mental health is equally important, right? And so for me, when I look at relationship with food, one of the first things I look at is, does any food give you anxiety? Is there any food where if we were out in any situation, whether it's your child's birthday party or your birthday party or any event, is there any food where if it was offered to you, it gives you anxiety at the thought of eating it? Does it make you think, this food is gonna make me unhealthy. This food is gonna make me fat. This food is gonna make me ruin all my progress. If you feel that way about any food in particular, that is a problem that needs to be addressed. And that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about right here, okay? So that's sort of my timeline, my story uh, with my relationship with food. If you have any specific questions about it, first watch the video of how I overcame my, my binge eating disorder because I think that will give you a lot of context and help. But if you watch that and that doesn't answer your questions, feel free to leave a comment in this video and maybe I can cover that in a separate video. But what I wanna talk about now before we get into all of, uh, all of this whole discussion is this one big caveat, okay? When we're talking about healthy relationships with food, Inherently, there will definitely be people watching who, who are struggling with anorexia, struggling with bulimia, struggling with binge eating disorder, uh, struggling with their relationship with food. And what I wanna make clear is there are specialists that you can see in person or online on Zoom, whatever, to discuss your individual needs, goals, and preferences with. There are specialists that can help you. And if you are struggling with anorexia or you're struggling with bulimia or you're struggling with binge eating, you're welcome to watch this video, but please do not take what I'm saying as gospel and that you need to apply it to you individually. I really want you to be aware that there is help out there and well, I think my information is at least pretty good. No matter what, it cannot be specific to every single person, especially if you're currently struggling with uh, uh, disordered eating behavior. So please, if you are, don't feel shame about it. It's so common. It happens way more than I think most people think, and I would love for you to seek out help individually, okay? So with that being said, I've been holding this coffee cup for this entire time, and I haven't even taken a sip, so I'm just gonna put it on the desk. Awesome. Now. There is no such thing as, this is, the, this is really like the first one on the list. Um, this is the most important in my mind. This is going to help with essentially all of this, even something like extreme hunger, this is gonna help with sugar cravings, this is definitely gonna help with uh, boredom eating, maybe, uh, but all of this in terms of building a healthy relationship with food, this one right here is the foundation of it. It is without question the most important and what it boils down to is understanding there is no such thing as a good or bad food. And as I was planning this video and as I was thinking about it, you know, I tend to stay away from black and whites. I tend to stay away from like very dogmatic viewpoints. 
So I was sort of tussling, having an internal tussle, wrestling match with myself, being like, can someone have a healthier relationship with food and simultaneously believe that there is such a thing as a good or a bad food? And at this point in my life and career, I don't think so. I don't think that someone can look at a certain food as good or bad inherently and simultaneously have a healthy relationship with food. I think they're polarizing opposites. Now that doesn't mean that if someone is like, well, I think there's good foods and bad foods, it doesn't mean that they are unhealthy and it doesn't mean that they can't live a healthy life. But I think if you view certain foods as bad and you demonize them inherently, you place a moral value on them, you think that one food is inherently going to ruin all your progress, there's always gonna be some level of anxiety there there's gonna be some level of like, I cannot have that, I will not have that. And as soon as you create that barrier of, I cannot, I will not, I should not, this is when anxiety and, and disordered relations with food start to build. Which is why I'm actually, I'm, you know me, especially if you've been watching this channel for a long time by now, I do not like hard absolutes, dogmatics, black and whites. And maybe in the future I'll change my opinion on this. But as of right now, you need to understand there is no such thing as a single good or a bad food. If you don't understand this, it will make it exponentially more difficult, if not impossible, to have a healthy relationship with food. This is really the base of the pyramid of your healthy relationship with food. And there's a lot that we can talk about this and we're sort of get, gonna get into it when we get into here. But once you understand this, that there, like one food is not going to make or break your progress. One food is not going to make or break your health. One food, one meal is not going to ruin you. Once you get this, it's gonna make everything so much easier. Because when you look at a single food as just bad, right? When that one food enters your life, could be pizza, could be pretzels, could be ice cream, could be donuts, whatever it is. That one food is bad and it enters into your, into your bubble and that fear and anxiety crops up like, oh my God, if I have this, I'm doing something bad, I'm doing something wrong, I'm doing something dangerous, I'm doing something unhealthy. Well, what happens? Either, you no, know, I can't have it, which might isolate you from the social situation, which we all understand like health is, is far more than just physical. There's, there's mental, there's emotional, there's social, inter, intrapersonal, all of these things, right? So it might isolate you from a social situation, which could make it that very much more difficult for you. Maybe in the future, you won't go to those social situations. So God forbid you don't have to face that one fucking food. Like that's not healthy. That's not a good life you want to live. Or maybe you'll get to a point, you'll be like, oh my God, this is really bad. All right. I'm, I'm not gonna eat this ever again, I'm only gonna eat this now. And what happens when you only eat it now? You have as much of it as you possibly can. It's impossible to, to uh, look at it in, from that perspective, from that bad perspective, and then not binge eat it in that. Because in that. when people say I'm an all or nothing person, I'm either gonna have no pizza or all the pizza. What they're saying is, I think pizza is bad, so either I'm not gonna eat it at all, or if I do eat it, since I'm already fucking up my progress, since I'm already ruining everything, I might as well have as much of it as I possibly can, because I'm not gonna let myself eat it ever again, which we all know how that works. They binge, they binge, they binge, then they feel terrible, they restrict themselves going forward, they don't eat for, they, they barely, barely, barely eat, they don't let them have any other bad foods for a week, two weeks, a month, whatever it is, until they binge again. This is not a healthier relationship with food. It is a much healthier relationship with food to be able to have one, two, three slices, feel satisfied, and then move on with the rest of your day and then get right back on track, right? So once you understand that there is no such thing as a good or a bad food, this sets you up for a lifetime healthier relationship with food. Okay, next on this list is you must understand that one meal or one day or one food will not make or break your progress. And I know this goes very much in line with what I was just talking about, but I wanna tell you a little story. And if you heard my TED talk, then you've heard this story before, but uh, I'm gonna reiterate it here. I vividly remember when I, uh, I was in high school or just out of high school and I was on a date with a girl. I had had a crush on this girl for a super long time. And we went on a date, we went to Friendly's and she ordered a black raspberry ice cream cone and in my mind, before the date, I was like, you know, I'm gonna get ice cream, it'll be great, blah, blah, blah. But when we finally sat down, once we get there, and she orders a black raspberry ice cream cone, I start to get nervous, I start to get anxious. I'm like, oh my God, ice cream. Like, it's gonna make me fat. It's gonna ruin my progress. Da, 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 da. All these things that had been instilled within me through wrestling, through starving myself, through binge eating, I'd be like, if I had this ice cream, it's gonna ruin all my progress. So I shit you not, I'm on a date with this girl, first date I've had a crush on for years, she gets a black raspberry ice cream cone and 
I tell the waiter, I'm good. And she looks at me and she's like, we're on an ice cream date. Like, do you, you're not gonna get anything? I was like, no, I'm actually, I'm not really hungry, which was bullshit. Like, of course I wanted the ice cream. I was hungry. I just, I thought it was gonna ruin my progress. And needless to say, like that relationship didn't go anywhere, which is fine. I have an amazing wife and daughter now, but what an awful situation. I invite this girl out to an ice cream date and then I don't even get ice cream because I was petrified this one ice cream was gonna ruin all of my progress. And I tell you this story, number one, so you can understand, you know, I've struggled with it as well. But number two, I think we all logically know that one meal isn't going to make or break your progress. No one ever got skinny from having one salad, just like no one ever got fat from having one ice cream cone. And this is something, if nothing else, even though you logically know this, keep this as a mantra in your head. Write this down, put it on your refrigerator, put it on your mirror, make it the background in your phone. I don't give a fuck what you do. Make sure you constantly remind yourself, if you find yourself getting anxiety around certain foods or not allowing yourself to have certain foods, no one got skinny from having one salad and no one got fat from having one donut. You need to remember this because logically you know it. If a friend told you, oh my God, I'm really nervous about going out to this dinner, da 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 da, you would probably tell them, it's just one dinner. It's not a big deal. It's, it's literally one meal. Enjoy yourself. You don't need a binge. You don't need to have like as much as you possibly can fit into your stomach, but enjoy it just get back on track the next day. But when it's you, you're going out to a dinner, you're going out to an event, or God forbid, you just wanna have some fucking ice cream at home. It's like you start shaming yourself and guilting yourself and thinking it's bad, and you run through this whole awful cycle. You need to remind yourself, no one got fat from having one donut, just like no one got skinny from having one salad. Progress in either direction takes time. So please keep this as a mantra in your head. Okay, now before we move forward, I completely fucked up and I combined two and three into one. I just said, you must understand one meal or one food, whatever will not ruin your progress, which is true, but they were supposed to be two separate things. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna cross this one out because I already fucking said it and talk about instead about what you also must understand is energy balance. And specifically, you must understand that all calories are created equal. Now this, every time I say it, sets off a fucking hurricane and a shitstorm of people who are like, no, 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 all calories are not created equal. You don't know what you're talking about. Good calories, bad calories, blah, 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 blah. Fuck, shut up. It's not accurate and let's talk about this, okay? So anytime someone says all calories are not created equal, I always ask, well, would you mind telling me what a calorie is? Because if we're gonna argue about calories and good calories and bad calories and what they are and what they aren't, we have to def define what the fuck it is. And I understand when you say, well, can you define this for me? It sounds obnoxious, but we actually need to do it. We need to know what a calorie is so we can actually get the definition so we know what the fuck we're arguing about, okay? So what is a calorie? Very simply, a calorie is a unit of measurement. And more specifically, a calorie tells you how much energy you're putting into your body, right? So when I talk about a calorie deficit, you need to be in a calorie deficit in order to lose weight. What I'm actually saying is an energy deficit. You are not putting as much energy in your body as your body needs to maintain its current weight. You need less energy so that you can lose weight. Whereas if you have a calorie surplus, an energy surplus, then you're putting more energy in your body and that extra energy will be able to be stored and converted into other things so you gain weight. It's just energy and specifically how much energy you're putting in your body. Now, when we're looking at, at units of measurement, which is what a calorie is, a unit of measurement, let's look at other units of measurement. For example, a mile. And if you follow the channel for a while, you know what I'm gonna say, but this is a really, really important analogy. When we look at a mile, no one would argue that there are, are uh, different lengths of a mile. A mile is always a mile. It doesn't matter if the mile is going uphill or if the mile is going downhill. It doesn't matter if the mile is in the woods or the forest or on sand or on pavement. It doesn't matter where the fuck the mile is. A mile is always a mile. Now, from here, we can look at running a mile uphill will take far longer than it will to run a mile downhill. Running a mile on sand will be way more difficult than running a mile on pavement but it doesn't change the fact that you're still running the exact same distance. 
one mile. So bringing this back to calories, which is just another unit of measurement, we could look at the calories in a donut versus the calories in an apple. 100 calories from a donut is the exact same as 100 calories from an apple because it's just a unit of measurement. That's all it is. Now, 100 calories from a donut might be a bite this big, whereas 100 calories from an apple might be the whole apple. Also, the nutrient composition of those 100 calories is gonna be completely different. The apple is probably gonna fill you up more. It's gonna have more micronutrients, more overall nutrition. It might contribute overall better to your health. We'll talk about that in a second, because not necessarily. But generally speaking, the apple, the, the nutrient composition of that apple is very different than the, the nutrient composition of that my, of that of the donut, excuse me, in the same way that the composition of, of running a mile on sand is different than running a mile on pavement, but you're still running a mile. So when we're talking about how much energy you're putting in your body, a calorie is always a calorie, and by definition, all calories are created equal. This does not mean that calories are all that matter in life. This does not mean that you can eat whatever the fuck you want in whatever quantity you want and still be healthy. There are many people who have a healthy body fat percentage who are not healthy individuals, right? So it's not just saying that calories are the end all be all, but it is saying that when it comes to weight gain and weight loss, priority number one is calories and all calories are created equal. Why is this important for creating a healthy relationship with food? Because if you wanna eat the donut and include that within your total daily calories, you should have zero fucking guilt about having the donut. If you want some pizza, there should be zero guilt about having pizza and fitting that into your calories. Should all of your daily calories be donuts and pizza every single day? Of course not. That's a fucking stupid idea and you won't be healthy if you do that. But what I think is, if you have an overall healthy diet, an overall nutritious, uh, a very whole foods based diet, 80% of the time, and you go out and you want to enjoy some pizza with your friends and family, that's okay. And I would argue that not being able to do that is more unhealthy, right? If you can't do that without feeling anxiety, that is an unhealthy relationship with food. I'll give you an example. For one person, let's use the donut example. For one person being able to say no, no, I don't, I don't want that donut right now, that's progress, right? Because maybe that person has struggled historically with, uh, with eating too much of this type of food. They, they haven't prioritized more whole nutritious food. So being able to say, you know, you know what, I don't want that right now. Maybe they've struggled with boredom eating or whatever it is, and they just regularly go to those foods for whatever reason. You know what, I'm not gonna have the donut. That might be progress for that person. But for someone else, maybe saying yes to the donut without it causing anxiety, without it causing fear, without it taking over their entire, like their, their brain power for the next day, being able to have that, enjoy it and get back on track, that's progress. So it's not the food in and of itself that makes it good or bad, it's your relationship with it. And we could have the exact same food and for two different people, saying yes to it or no to it could be progress for both of those people, right? So we have to understand Number one, that all calories are created equal. And once you get that understanding energy balance that in order to lose weight, you need to be in an energy or calorie deficit. Once we get this and we remove all moral value and all of this, this, uh, this idea of good and bad from individual foods, then we can progress and say, cool, how can I structure my diet? What strategies and tactics can I do to make my diet more sustainable, more enjoyable over the long term without having guilt or fear or, or any shame associated with individual foods? So once you understand there's no good food or bad food and that all calories are created equal, that is the base layer foundation for your healthy relationship with food. Tick, 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 tick. Boom. <laughs> okay, this is a very good one. One that I don't hear talked about enough. To create balance, there must be periods of time of unbalance. And I wanna talk about this. I wanna talk about this because it's sort of ambiguous and we're gonna get in the weeds here, but I think once you understand this, it will make having periods of unbalance in your life, rather than it seeming scattered and unproductive, you will actually look at periods of unbalance as a time of productivity and improvement. And I'm gonna give you an example before I discuss exactly what I mean, okay? Um, as you'll see in the video about how I overcame my binge eating disorder, which again is in the link to the link uh, under this video, I spoke about how one of the best things I did 
to help me stop binge eating was actually I stopped counting calories, okay? Before I stopped counting calories, I had many years where I did count calories and I wasn't balanced. I wasn't balanced with it. I was counting every single calorie. I would count the fucking calories in my spinach. I would weigh it. I would measure it. I'd, I'd weigh and measure my onions for fuck's sake. I would weigh and measure everything. It was very unbalanced and it was very disordered and it was very unhealthy. But the benefit of having that is once I stopped counting calories, I still had so much of the knowledge that I developed prior to know what a portion size looked like. So having all of that unbalanced before actually led to allow me to create more balance now in my life. Now, for example, I just finished my mini cut, as you saw throughout my YouTube uh, videos in the last like eight weeks or so. I didn't weigh and measure a single fucking food. I didn't measure a single food. I just have a good idea now of what it looks like because I've done it previously. Now, I'm not saying that you should weigh and measure your spinach. I think if you're weighing and measuring your spinach, you've got a fucking problem, right? Like that's not a good idea. You don't need to take it to that extreme. But I know a lot of people will say, I don't want to weigh and measure food. I don't want to count calories. It's just, I'm not, I, I don't want to go that hard into it. It's like, it's sort of a short-sighted way of looking at things. And I'm not saying everyone needs to count calories, but if you've never counted your calories, even for a week, how can you possibly know how much you're eating? It would sort of be like, let's say your car didn't have a gauge to tell you how full or how empty your gas was. You had no idea. When you put the, the gas nozzle and you fill it up, you know when it's full because the car will tell you you're full, but you have no idea where you are in terms of is it close to empty, is it half full, where are you? You don't know because the gauge won't tell you. You need to know where you are. Okay, listen, I, here's an exit coming up on the highway. I should probably get off and fill up here because I can see that I'm at this level. Or you know what, I've got plenty. I'm gonna keep going for the next 50 miles. I've got plenty of gas in the tank. You know that solely because you can see how much you've got in the tank right there. Calorie counting is the same thing. If you don't know how much you're eating ever and you've never counted calories, not even for seven days or fuck it, 72 hours for three days or fuck it, 24 hours for one day, how do you have any idea how much you're eating? How can you possibly know? So for the people who say things like, I don't wanna count calories, I'm never gonna do that, you're probably thinking like, I don't wanna do this for the rest of my life, which I'm with you. I don't wanna do it for the rest of my life either. That's why I don't. But I very strongly recommend, if you're struggling with your weight and you're struggling with your relationship with food and you just don't know why it's not working, it might be a good idea to spend, I don't know, three days, seven days, a month, tracking your calories so that you get a better idea of what a portion size actually looks like. And then if you don't wanna count calories, you don't have to. But now you know, you had a period of unbalance in order to create a longer period of balance. And this also works on the complete other end of the spectrum. Let's say you've been counting calories for five years straight and you meticulously count everything. You weigh and measure everything. You bring your food scale with you to friends' houses. That's a big fucking problem. Please don't do that. Don't bring your food scale with you to holiday parties, your friends' houses, to restaurants. That's a sign of a real disordered eating, eating habit. But anyway, if that's what you do and you're scared to stop counting calories, well, now you need to have a period of, un you, you have a period of unbalance right now. You're not balanced if you're doing that. You cannot say you bringing a food scale to your friend's house is a balanced behavior. It's not, I'm sorry. Actually, you know what, I'm not sorry. It's just not a balanced behavior. So now you need to create a period of unbalance in order to reach more balance down the road. So for example, if you're struggling with counting calories, one of the things that I recommend people do is, listen, you, you've developed an amazing, amazing uh, level of knowledge knowing what a portion size looks like but you, you're so unbalanced now that we need to get you to stop counting calories so you can have more balance in your life. So one of the, the scariest things for people is to think, oh my God, if I'm gonna stop counting calories, I'm gonna get fat, I'm not gonna know how, know how much I'm eating. So here's what I recommend, a very simple approach to, to get into this uh, not counting is just simply take one day a week. If you're counting seven days a week for every single meal, take one day a week, probably a work day, ideally Monday, just take Monday, don't count calories on Monday. Just that, Monday you don't count, you don't weigh, you don't measure, you don't count. You keep everything the same, you keep your meals the same, you eat what you normally do, but you do not count. Then Tuesday through Sunday you do count. Do this for a month. For one month, Mondays you don't count, but every other day you do. The next month, Monday, Tuesday, you don't count, but Wednesday through Sunday you do. Do that for a month. The next month, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you don't count. And then 
Thursday through Sunday, you do count. You do this for seven months and all of a sudden you're not gonna be counting anymore. And the cool part about this is we can go back up to here or wherever the fuck it was, or one meal will not ruin your progress, one day will not ruin your progress. Number one, is you know one day of eating is not gonna ruin your progress, even if you go completely off track, right? But now, all, just because you're not gonna be counting calories on this first Monday doesn't mean you're gonna completely change everything you eat. Keep your meals the same, do exactly what you normally do, just don't weigh, don't measure, and just go on with your day. Once you see this and once you realize, oh, that day didn't ruin my progress, cool. Then you do that for another month, boom, go to Tuesday, Monday and Tuesday. And progressively, over the course of seven months, you will no longer be counting calories. And you'll still be using appropriate portion sizes. You'll still have a good uh, understanding of how much you're eating, but you won't be meticulously counting. And going back to this whole topic of to create balance, there needs to be periods of unbalance. At any point in my life with literally anything I've accomplished, whether it was with business or with my, or my relationships or whatever it is, or with food, I've had to go through periods of intense learning and intense study and really intensely diving into something to, to at the maybe not master it, but to get very good at it. Once you get very good at something, you don't need to spend as much time on it. You can take a step back, sort of let it coast, and then focus on something else. But if you never spend that large amount of time, that unbalanced amount of time on that one thing, it's gonna be very difficult for you to excel in it. This is why when people tell me, hey, I wanna grow my business. I'm like, listen, if you wanna grow your business, like there's gonna be periods of time where you gotta go fucking hard on your business. I did that for many, many years. Now I'm at a point where I can take a step back. I don't have to go as hard. I can spend more time with my wife, more time with my daughter, more time with my friends, go out with Mitch and his wife, all this stuff, where I don't have to work as hard as I did. But in order to create that balance in life, whether it's with food, whether it's in business, whether it's relationships, whether it's with health, whatever it is, you need to have unbalance. Uh, a really good friend and mentor of mine told me something years ago that has always rung true. He said, out of your health, your sleep, uh, your fitness, your business, and your relationships, out of those five things, you can only ever really focus on three. And in my experience, it's really only two. I just held up three. It's really only two. That was one of the most awkward situations I've ever had in this whole filming. Over 12 years I've been doing this. You can only ever focus on two of those, I really think. Like really giving a lot of attention to it. If you try and do everything at once, you're gonna do nothing. If you try and please everybody, you're gonna please nobody, especially yourself. If you try and do everything all at once, you're not gonna excel in anything. So understand that if you want to develop a healthy relationship with food, maybe you spend a little bit of time going all in on calorie counting. Or on the other end, maybe it's time for you to not be calorie counting. Whatever it is, there's going to be periods of unbalance and discomfort, but knowing that will eventually lead to more comfort down the road. Whew, all right, that's a lot. Now we're gonna get into maybe more of the fun stuff. I don't know. Uh, if you're liking this video, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you don't already. Leave a comment, by the way, I pick three people from every video who leave a comment to win a free month in the inner circle. So if you haven't done that yet, leave a comment. Um, let's talk about boredom eating, okay? Boredom eating. The first question about boredom eating that people ask is, well, how do I know if it's boredom eating or binge eating? Which people who truly binge eat, they hear that and oftentimes they'll laugh. They'll be like, oh, huh, you would know if you were actually binge eating. Um, there are many uh, traits that characterize a binge arguably one of the most important and most telling ones is it's, it's almost uncontrollable. And I say almost because if I say it's just purely uncontrollable, then that would mean you could never get over binge eating. So you can get over it and that's really important to understand, but binge eating, it, it, it's like a nearly uncontrollable impulse that is even if you're full, even if you aren't hungry, it's just like you feel this overwhelming urge to eat an unbelievable amount of food, okay? It's not just something where you're like, uh, do I want something? I don't know, I'm gonna open up the pantry and take, it's not what it is. That's boredom eating. Boredom eating is where you're like, uh, I don't know, I'm around the house right now. I could put something in my mouth, that's what she said. I could put a little snack in my mouth. I just want the taste of something. That's boredom eating. Now, a simple way to tell if you're actually boredom eating and not just hungry is I have something called the apple test, okay? and. A lot of people are like, well, what if I don't like apples? It doesn't have to be a fucking apple, okay? It could be a banana test. It could be a, a, a watermelon test. It could be a papaya test. Fill in whatever fucking fruit you want, okay? The apple test is very simply, ask yourself, 
am I hungry enough to eat an apple? And I always keep apples in my apartment. I literally just had an apple before we started filming. You can ask Mitch. Did I have an apple before we came down here? Yes, you did. Yes, I did. Apple and coffee. Um, I'm not bragging, but I just did. You know what? I am bragging. I had a fucking apple before this. Anyway, ask yourself, are you hungry enough to eat an apple? And I always keep apples in my fridge because I can not just ask myself, but literally, you know what? I'm going to eat the apple. If I'm, I'm going to eat it. If I'm not hungry enough to go in the fridge and pull the apple out and eat it, then I'm really not that hungry. Period. I'm, I'm clearly not that hungry if I am not hungry enough to eat the apple. Now, I'm not saying before you ever eat, you always need to eat an apple. That's ridiculous. That would be a disordered behavior. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is if you're in a moment where maybe you're just hanging out, it's 8 or 9 p.m., you're watching a show with your spouse or by yourself or whatever it is, and you're like, hmm, I want some popcorn. But then you're like, hmm, is this actually hunger or is this just boredom? Am I hungry enough to eat an apple? Yeah, you know what, I am. I'm gonna go have the apple first, and then if I still want the popcorn, I'll have that. It's the apple test. And again, fill it in with whatever fruit you want. Bananas, watermelons, papayas, kiwis, I don't care. Pick a fruit. And if you don't like fruit, the fuck are you? The fruit's amazing, come on. Don't, don't say you don't like fruit. And if you're the person who says, no, I don't eat fruit because sugar makes you fat, just stop watching here and go to another channel. I don't, I don't even wanna deal with that shit, right? Fruit doesn't make you fat. No one ever got fat from eating blueberries, okay? Anyway, using that apple test is a really good way to try and figure out if you're actually boredom eating or hunger, or you're truly hungry. Now, in terms of boredom eating, well, how do you get over it? Cool, let's say like it's something you struggle with. You do the apple test, but you still boredom eat. One thing that we need to talk about here is habit development, right? Because what you're essentially trying to do is you're trying to change a habit. And oftentimes people boredom eat out of habit certain times of day, certain times of night, at, like routinely, they regularly boredom eat. And it's something they do over and over and over, and it just becomes part of the daily routine. When we're looking at habit development, we have to understand adding another habit is very, very difficult. Adding another habit to your life is super challenging. It's not impossible, but you're busy. You've got a lot of shit going on anyway, and adding another habit is super challenging. It's also equally challenging, maybe even more, I need to look at the research on this, it's very challenging to take away a habit. Just, to, you know, I'm not gonna do this anymore. I will not do this anymore. Both of those, either adding or removing, very difficult. So what do we do instead? You switch. You switch one behavior for another behavior. Rather than saying, I'm just gonna add this on top of it or I'm just not gonna boredom eat anymore. How about instead of boredom eating, I will do this instead. Now, that's part of the apple test, right? Part of the apple test is saying, hey, so instead of just immediately going for the boredom food, I'm, hey, you know what? First, am I hungry enough to eat an apple? You know what I am? I'll eat the apple first. Cool. That's sort of that switch, but you could do anything else, right? You could add, you could add another habit on top of it. You could have a different switch of a habit if you'd like. For example, I have a walking pad outside my office. I just got this little like a, a, a desk bike. One habit you could do is literally, you know what? Instead of going to boredom eat right now, I'm just gonna go on a 10 minute walk. That's all I'm gonna do, 10 minute walk. If after that walk, you still feel like eating, go for it. If after the apple, you still feel like eating, go for it. If after, I don't know, reading 10 pages of a book, you still feel like eating, cool, go for it. You can pick whatever habit you want to replace it with. I don't know why that's my habit switch motion, but that's the one that I chose. After you do that, if you're still hungry, you still wanna eat, go for it. No guilt, no shame, no anxiety attached to it. You're welcome to do it. But if it's truly boredom eating and then you make that switch, there I go again, you make that habit switch, that might help you get to a point where you're like, you know what? I was just gonna eat out of boredom. I actually don't need this anymore. So could be calling a friend, could be reading 10 pages of a book, could be reading one page of a book, could be doing the apple test, could be going on a walk, whatever it is. Pick one thing to switch with that habit so you have something to do instead of it immediately. And oftentimes the impulse to boredom eat will dissipate once that time is over. Now this topic, this is a very incendiary topic. This is a super highly debated, very emotionally driven topic. We're talking about sugar cravings, okay? This is, uh, this is big. I'm sure a lot of people are watching this video literally just for this section. We're gonna dive into it, all right? And I know people are gonna get really mad in the comments and all riled up about what I'm about to say, but fuck it, this is the truth. Number one, we have to talk about sugar cravings. The first thing that people talk about right now is, I am addicted to sugar. This is something I've uh, really struggled with because I've been, you know, I've looked into the research around addictions, 
right? Uh, there are some people who say food is not addictive, and there are other people who say food is addictive. Uh, there are other people who say sugar is super addictive. Sugar is worse for you than cigarettes. Whoever says that is a fucking idiot. That's not accurate. Um, but I've really gone back and forth on whether or not sugar is addictive. And from what I've seen th thus far in the research, I've come to the conclusion that sugar itself is not addictive. And I'm gonna explain this. If that hurts your feelings, offends you, blah, 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 please keep watching. This is actually really important. Um, food can be addictive, more so the behaviors around food as opposed to any individual food in and of itself, but behaviors can absolutely be addictive. We can have addictive behaviors and habits for sure. For example, uh, there are a lot of psychological addictions, right? I mean, sex addiction, for example. For some reason, this is a, a very taboo topic to talk about, but sex addiction is real. Like, no one argues that. So it's not just like a substance addiction. Like, there are, are psychological addictions as well, but sugar in and of itself is not addictive, okay? Now, a, a very simple example that we can use here is actually the, you know, the COVID pandemic, right? It's been very interesting for me as a nutrition coach to, to watch what happened around people who said that they were addicted to sugar. One of the major side effects of COVID was a loss of taste and a loss of smell. And among the people, or many people who struggled with what they said was sugar addiction, as soon as they lost the ability to taste or smell, they were not eating the sugar-filled foods anymore which if sugar actually was addictive, regardless of the taste or the smell, they would have kept eating it because it would have addictive properties that would require you to keep doing it over and over and over again. Once they lost the taste and smell effect of it, oftentimes they just stopped eating it all together. It just didn't bring them any happiness anymore. It didn't give them that anymore. So we can see it wasn't the sugar. It was oftentimes the response to that, but also, and this is getting more into the weeds here, how many of you who say you're addicted to sugar are opening up a bag of sugar and eating sugar out of the bag? I would imagine literally no one watching this. If you are, I would actually talk to a health professional and a psychologist if you're actually spooning sugar out of a bag. Um, and that's not a joke, I'm serious. If you're actually doing that, please speak to a professional. Um, usually, the foods that you find the most palatable, the, the most enjoyable, that are also high in sugar are also very high in fat. Okay, so I don't care if it's donuts, uh, I don't care if it's ice cream. Usually, high sugar foods that you find addictive and most enjoyable are also very high in fat. This is not an accident. This is by design. This is very deliberate by food companies because what food companies have done is they've spent millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions and potentially billions of dollars testing different food combinations to figure out what tastes the best. What is the most difficult for you to have and then put down? They want you to keep eating it. Why is that? Because the more you eat, the more you buy, the more you put money in their pockets, okay? The more you eat of their product, the more you enjoy their product, the more you're gonna buy it. This is all by design. They spend hundreds of millions of dollars on focus groups, on scientific experiments to figure out how can we make this food more palatable, more enjoyable. Now, getting in the addiction aspect of it, there might, you might have a, a certain behavior or at a, when you have a certain emotion, for example, sadness, uh, anger, depression, jealousy, whatever, you might have a certain emotion that every time that emotion happens, you're more likely to go to a certain food, more of a comfort food, okay? Now, this behavior loop, we can fall into addictive behaviors with it, but the food in and of itself is not addictive. And it's important to understand this. But let's just say for the sake of argument for people who might be uh, maybe upset about it or just won't, don't believe me, they still think it's addictive. Let's say for the sake of argument, let's say it is addictive. Okay. Let's just say for, you know, fuck it. Sugar's addictive. Cool. Ice cream's addictive. Donuts are addictive. Whatever. Does that mean that you just should not try to improve your relationship with that food? Like, let's say someone's addicted to alcohol. Like, alcohol addiction is real. Would you just say, ah, it's addictive. Sorry, you're fucked. No. Cigarettes are, ah, oh, you're addicted to cigarettes? Whatever. You're fucked. No. They're going to go ha have to go through a very difficult period of time in order to remove that from their life. They're going to have to have a period of unbalance in order to find balance, right? They're going to have to go through a very difficult period of time in, or in order to remove that addictive substance from their life, okay? Now, the main difference here, obviously, is that something like sugar 
is you don't want to have to completely remove it. You don't want it out of your life forever. You want to be able to enjoy it in moderation. But there's actually, you know, going back to alcohol, there's actually a, a fair amount of research showing that while some people who struggle with alcoholism do better with just completely removing it from their life, there are other people who once they've removed it and they get over the, the uh, addictive behaviors with it and the addictive relationship with it, they can actually reintroduce it. And I'm, that's not a recommendation, okay? This is not a suggestion for people who struggle with alcoholism, but there is research on this and it is worth bringing up, okay? So even if it is addictive, it's not a, an excuse or a justification to just you know, keep doing the, the ha having the behaviors and habits that you currently have. If you are really struggling with sugar cravings, it's important to know that you can get over them and you do not have to either binge it or not have it at all, which gets into my next point. If you're struggling with sugar cravings or really with any cravings, but we'll stick with sugar for right now, I think one of the worst things you can do is say, I can't have that. It's a terrible thing to do because as soon as you say, I can't have that, well, that's all you're gonna want. It's sort of like, I don't know about you, but for me personally, ever since I was a kid, ever, every time I walk by a fire alarm, all I want to do with my entire being is pull the fucking fire, like all the time. Cause I know I'm not allowed, I'm not supposed to. Once, you, if I said, hey, don't think of a white elephant, immediately you're thinking of a white elephant. If I say, hey, don't think of a giant veiny penis, you're automatically thinking of a giant veiny penis, right? When you say don't do something, Basic human psychology 101, you wanna do it, or at least you're thinking about it, right? So as soon as you say, I can't have that, that's all you're gonna think about. And then it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds until you fucking break. And then you feel you're like, what's wrong with me? Well, you sort of put that on yourself. So what we wanna do is, there are two different approaches to dealing with real severe sugar cravings, okay? Number one is the first approach I like to try is having it in more moderation. Okay, and I know this is very difficult and I'm gonna talk about a second approach if this doesn't work for you. But in trying moderation in the beginning, I think is a good starting out tactic. And, and there are many ways you can begin with trying moderation, but number one is just like, let's say, I don't know, it's ice cream. Instead of eating it out of the tub, say, okay, I can have one bowl of this ice cream. Cool, scoop it out, put it in the bowl, and you have that. Now, for many people, this will work, it'll be great. For other people, they put it in the bowl, they eat it, and they're like, fuck it, I still want more, and they go back and they eat the whole thing. So if that's you, if you struggle with the moderation aspect, this is gonna go back to, in order to create balance, there needs to be periods of unbalance, and there's a lot of research around this. For many people, it does not work just to say to have it in moderation, right? If we're assuming it's addictive with alcohol, just to go to someone and say, well, you just have it in moderation, good fucking luck, that doesn't really work, right? So sometimes, the best way to develop a better relationship with it is to remove it completely from what you can have, okay? Now, a lot of people, especially in the flexible dieting crowd, hate when I say this, but there's a tremendous amount of research. For example, um, there's a tremendous amount of research showing that this actually helps. Many people in the fitness industry often really struggle with peanut butter. This is a very common one. Now, it has nothing to do with sugar. Like, obviously, you know, like Skippy and stuff does have a lot of sugar, but I mean like real peanut butter that's mainly just like peanuts and salt. Um, it's not just sugar and fat combinations, it's also salt and fat combinations that are highly palatable, that make it are very difficult to put down. But a lot of people in the fitness industry, they struggle with peanut butter for many, many reasons sort of outside the scope of this, this discussion. But once they have peanut butter, if there's a jar, they'll eat the whole jar. They'll eat the whole thing. And if you're that kind of person, whether it's with peanut butter or with ice cream or whatever it is, if it's in your house, it's very difficult for you to have it in moderation at all. Get it out. I don't care if it's sugar-based, uh, salt-based, fat-based, whatever. If you have a trigger food or a sugar or a certain food that really causes you to like just go completely bananas, get it out of the house. And I'm not saying forever. If it happens to be forever, fine, but you don't have to do it forever. But I say at least for 30 days, get it out of the house and make a bright line. Do not have that food for at least 30 days. Now, oftentimes what this can do is, is it's that first, like the first day is the hardest. The first week is the hardest week, but each week, each day, it gets a little bit easier, a little bit easier, a little bit easier. And once you get through that first like week and you can go a whole like 30 days without it, you often get to a point where you're like, I really don't need it. This wasn't something I needed. It was just something that was readily available to me. And so I had it. But once you prove to yourself you don't need it, then you can try to bring it back and have it in moderation. For some people, you might need to remove it for more than 30 days. It might need to be 60 or 90 or 100 or whatever, it might be a year. But for most people, after 30, 60, 90-ish days, 
you can bring it back and have it in a bit more moderation. This continues. This is not by not a mistake that the last one here was sometimes in order to create balance, you have to have unbalance. This is super, super important. This is all by design. Sometimes you need to remove something completely in order to be able to bring it back and have more moderation. We see this a lot in relationships. How many of you, and you obviously can't raise your hand, I can't see you, I'm recording this weeks before you're gonna watch this video anyway, but how many of you watching this have maybe had a relationship with someone, a, a romantic relationship, maybe even a friendship, but we'll stick with a romantic relationship. You have a relationship with someone, the relationship goes bad, goes sour, not good, you, I hate you, you hate each other, whatever, you break up, you don't talk for years. Then you reconnect like three years later and you're like, oh, hey, and you can have a nice relationship with them. You don't like them romantically anymore. You definitely don't want to be with them, but you can have a nice civil relationship. It's not toxic. It's not poisonous. It's not what it used to be, but you just needed some space. That happens a lot with food as well, with certain exercises as well. This happens in all aspects of life. Sometimes you just need space in order to realize I don't need this. It doesn't have as much power over me as I thought. I'm going to remove it completely and then I can bring it back in at some point in the future. It's a very important thing to understand when it comes to sugar. Now, I know that was a lot on sugar and sugar addiction and cravings and moderation and blah, 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 blah. I hope it was helpful. If you have any more questions about sugar, put them in the comments. Now we're talking about extreme hunger. This is the last one on the list. This is super important. And I think um, there's a large subset of the population that doesn't understand how hunger can affect different people differently. I think a lot of people assume like whatever their level of hunger is, is what everybody's level of hunger is, which is sort of like thinking your worldview is like everybody's worldview. That's just, it's not how it works. And hunger is something that has interested me for a long time because for example, when I was struggling with binge eating, my hunger was on a different fucking level. It, I can't even begin to tell you. And it was crazy because Binge eating, as you'll see in the video, which again is linked in the description of this video if you wanna see how I overcame binge eating. When I wasn't eating, I wasn't hungry at all. I could go all day, not eating, no problem whatsoever. Like not even think about food. But once I started eating, oh my God, I was uh, like a, a landfill. I just couldn't fill me up. I could not at all. And this is important because the first thing I wanna talk about, when, it, especially when it comes to extreme hunger, is if you struggle with outrageously extreme hunger and seem like you can never get full, I want you to see a doctor, okay? I really want you to see a doctor to, to have a discussion. Um, there, especially if you really struggle with your weight, you might ha have, have morbid obesity. There's a real case for taking some medications, okay? And I'm not the biggest fan of, of weight loss medication for like just aesthetic purposes if you wanna lose like 10, 15, 20 pounds. But if, if you are like pre-diabetic, diabetic, struggling with your weight at such a level that it's really causing harm to your life and your, your uh, how long you could live and your quality of life, see a doctor. See if there's medication that could help with that. And I do not want fuckers in the comments being like, oh, taking medication, da, da, da. You have no clue. You don't know if this is not your specialty. There are people, especially people who often struggle with their weight, the hunger is something you couldn't imagine. You just don't get it. Ima imagine, I don't know, imagine like you're itchy all the time. Like you're everywhere. Like itch you know how annoying it is when you get a bug bite? Imagine that chronically. You're just constantly itchy. That would be like telling someone who's chronically itchy just to be like, ah, oh, you just, you know, just don't, don't worry about it. Just don't be itchy. It's like, what the fuck are you talking? Like, I'm so, it's all over my, I got bug bites all over my body, right? Some people, their levels of hunger are so high as chronic hunger and they can never get full, which makes losing weight for them infinitely harder. So if that's you, please see a doctor. Don't feel any shame in that. And if they give you some weight loss medication to help uh, subdue your hunger, that's fine. It's okay. It's not a big deal. If, however, you don't have like medically super high extreme hunger and you just wanna lose five or 10 pounds or 20 pounds just for the aesthetics of it, I wouldn't recommend taking a weight loss drug to blunt your hunger because that's probably more of a this problem as opposed to an actual physiological, like you, you are struggling with hunger. That's just like, I wanna lose more weight so I look better in a bikini and that's better with fixing your habits as opposed to trying to take a drug to help subdue your hunger that could also have other negative side effects, okay? Now, let's say you have hunger but it's not like the level where you would need medication for it. I wanna talk about two things that I think can really, really help 
uh, mitigate the hunger that you're feeling, especially if you're in a calorie deficit and you're trying to lose weight. Number one, and I actually spoke about this in the video of how I stopped binge eating, is stop counting calories. Now this isn't for everybody. For some people, counting calories is great. It can be a wonderful tool for many, many people. And I think for some people, it's just, like I said earlier, do it for a week or a month just to get an idea of your portion size. But if you've been counting for a long time and you're struggling with hunger, one of the reasons people struggle with hunger with calorie counting is because from the day when it starts, they have X amount of calories, we'll call it 2000. And every bite of food is a countdown until they can no longer eat anymore. And what did I say if I said, don't think of a big veiny penis, you think of a big veiny penis. What do I say if like you are not allowed to eat food after this point, that's all you're gonna think about is food after that point. And even though you might not actually be physiologically hungry, you feel like you're hungry because every bite is a countdown until that last bite, you can't have it anymore. You can't enjoy your food, it's not like, it's, it's awful, it's really, really bad. If this is you, you need to stop counting calories because you're thinking about food so much that you're creating hunger, even though physiologically you shouldn't be hungry, okay? Uh, go back to what I said earlier. If you happen to skip to this point and you didn't see the part where I said how to transfer from calorie counting to not calorie counting, go back and watch the whole video, motherfucker. I explained a system of how to go from calorie counting to not calorie counting, so go watch that. Now the last point, if you're struggling from extreme hunger or, or even just a, a lot of hunger, prioritizing two things. Okay, and if you're watching right now, I want you to guess, what am I about to say? What two things am I about to say you should prioritize? I know you're gonna guess at least one of them, which is, it rhymes with protein, protein, okay? To prioritize protein, okay? Protein, as I've said a million, bajillion, quadrillion fucking times, it's the most satiating macronutrient, it's gonna fill you up the most, has the highest thermic effect, and it's the only one that can really contribute to building muscle, okay? But protein, and again, I don't care if it's chicken, beef, turkey, tuna. I don't care if it's tofu. I don't care if it's tempeh. I don't care I don't, what it is. Protein is the most filling. It will fill you up the most for the least amount of calories. So if you are really struggling with getting full, prioritizing protein is super important. The other one, I don't know if you're gonna guess it. The other one rhymes with, Mitch, what do you think I'm gonna say? I think you're gonna say fiber. Yo, that's it, Mitch. Fuck it. Follow Mitch. Mitch's Instagram right here. Go follow Mitch. He did not know I was going to say that. Fiber. Prioritize fiber. Oh my God. I've been talking about this all the time. I've been shitting on the people who are saying you don't need fiber. The carnivore nonsense bullshit. Fiber is very important, not only for your health, but also to help keep you full. When you prioritize protein and you prioritize fiber, you are setting yourself up for a tremendous amount of success and also severely limiting how hungry you get. Okay? That's the video. I did this whole thing in almost one take. There were a couple of things that I fucked up. You saw me go back, have to cross that out. Let me check this off just to complete the video. That's it, that's all I've got for you. What do we got next? Do you have the Instagram Q&A next? Awesome, we're gonna do the Instagram Q&A next. We're keeping this exactly as it is. I love you, let's get to the Instagram Q&A. All right, Instagram questions. So actually, before we get into Instagram questions, just so you know, announcing the winners of people who won a free month in the inner circle at the end of this video. So if you want, yeah, you could skip ahead of that, just see if you won, or if you wanna support me in the channel, just watch the whole thing, right? Because, not because I make money from it, although there are ads, there, I do make a little bit of money from YouTube. Like, it honestly like pays for groceries if the video does pretty well, so not like that much, but it's significant but mainly because if you watch the whole video, YouTube shows it to more people. So the more people who see it, the more people can get helped by it. So that's what I mean by support the channel. Anyway, let's get into the Instagram questions. Uh, the first one is from uh, Carol. I don't know how to pronounce it. Carol or maybe Carol P. I don't know. Carol, what are your thoughts on not eating anything before working out, cardio or strength training? Example, 5 a.m. workout. If you want me to do a whole bit just on like peri-workout nutrition, uh, pre-workout, post-workout, intra-workout, all of that. I'm happy to do an entire segment or maybe video just on that. Just let me know in the comments if you want. For this question, I'm only gonna answer this specific question with super early morning workout, 5 a.m., what do you do for strength or cardio? Um, it's a really good question, very common question. For an early morning workout, strength or cardio, like a 5 a.m. workout, you do not need to eat before you do it. Especially, especially, I would say, if you're doing like a cardio workout, the last thing I wanna do, number one, the last thing I wanna do is work out at 5 a.m., but respect if you're doing that, like I love that you're getting it in. Um, the last thing I would wanna do 
before cardio is fill up and eat a lot. That just sounds absolutely awful. So because 5 a.m. is super early, you're probably not like waking up at three just to have a lot of time. I would say you have two options. Number one is regardless of whether it's strength or cardio, try to have a very big dinner the night before, or at least like a moderately big, it doesn't have to be a binge, but a, a substantial dinner, probably I would say at least like six to 800 calories on the low end, uh, and make sure you prioritize protein and carbs. That's the most important thing. Make sure you prioritize protein and carbs. If you really want to get into the weeds, it might make sense to have a slower digesting protein so you have more amino acids circulating throughout even like throughout the night and maybe even into the workout. So an example of a slower digesting protein would be like a casein type protein if you have a protein powder or even something like a Greek yogurt or a cottage cheese, a slower digesting protein. Now, if you have if you only eat for example just like steak or you know, a better example would be chicken because it has lower fat content. If you just have chicken for your dinner, then yeah, it would make sense to have like a slower digesting protein in addition to that. But most people are not just having chicken or just having steak or just having fish. They're usually combining it with like a protein and some carbs and some fats, and that inherently makes it a little bit more slower digesting. So if you don't, don't worry, don't stress over, I need to have a casein slower digesting protein. As long as you're having a mixed meal with several different types of foods, it's gonna slow the digestion. But if you have an early morning workout, it's a very, very good idea to make sure that at the very least, you do eat uh, a fair amount the night before. And again, 600 to 800 is on the lower end. Okay, it's a very low amount of calories prior to, like many hours prior to a workout. Um, if it's a cardio-based workout, I would also definitely emphasize carbohydrates because it's gonna be fueling the cardio. But it also depends on the type of cardio and the duration of the cardio. Um, if it's just like a 20-minute walk, no. It's a 20-minute walk. You don't really need anything. If it's more like a 30, 45, 60-minute run or higher-intensity bout, then yeah, carbohydrates are going to be much, 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 much more important and honestly more important than protein in that situation. Um, what you could do as well, let's say you're strength training in the morning but you don't really want to have a big meal at night, is you could just literally just sip on protein throughout your workout. So get a protein uh, a protein powder. I have, I, I, I use Legion, okay? I'm very good friends with the company owner, Mike Matthews, very good friend, so I am very, very biased. But I've used Legion for years, even before I became friends with Mike. You can use my code right here. If you wanna use that code, you get 20% off your first order. But literally just take it, put it in, in almond milk, put it in regular milk, put it in water if you don't want it to be too, uh, too thick, and just sip on it throughout your workout so you get a steady stream of amino acids. Uh, a lot of people talk about uh, BCAAs, which they're fine, but they're not necessary. It's essentially, if you're getting enough protein throughout your workout, throughout the day, excuse me, BCAAs are essentially you paying for expensive urine, right? Because you're just gonna be peeing out the excess of it. Like, uh, it's not bad, and if you like it, great, go for it. If you have the extra money you wanna spend it on BCAAs, fine, but they're not better than protein at all. And if you're getting enough protein through just regular food and what you're drinking and like, like a protein shake or whatever, you don't need them, it's just extra. So uh, either big meal the night before and or maybe sip on it throughout your workout and you'll be good to go. All right, next question is from Oblivion and they asked, what do you look for when eating out when you are doing a cut? So very good question, essentially, when I'm trying to lose weight, what do I look for in a restaurant or the foods I'm gonna eat at a restaurant so I can continue losing weight? Now, the thing about this question is, there's different scenarios based on not only uh, different people, but also based on like your overall schedule and what you normally do. My advice would be very different to someone who eats out at a restaurant several times a week, like three, four, five times a week, versus someone who eats out at a restaurant very occasionally, maybe a couple times a month, right? If you're trying to lose weight and you eat out at restaurants all the time, it's a very different discussion than someone who's just doing it like, I don't know, occasionally a couple times a month. So I'm gonna talk first about the person who does it occasionally and then give a little bit more towards the, towards the person who's eating out uh, several times a week. If you're in a cut, trying to lose weight, right? Cut is just another word for trying to lose weight. If you are trying to lose weight and you're going to a restaurant and it's something that you do very occasionally and your overall consistency has been great, I would say what I look for is food that I enjoy, period. That's it. I'm going to look for food that I want to eat because it tastes good. And that's it. Um, that's really it. I, the point in me saying this is if your consistency is overall on point and this is not a regular occurrence, well, what you should look for is just having a great time. 
because one meal, like we spoke about earlier in this video, is not gonna ruin your progress. So one of the things that makes a cut more sustainable, makes weight loss more sustainable, is not changing everything when you're trying to do it, right? I want you to be able to go to a restaurant and enjoy an amazing meal, have fun, go over your calories for that day, and then get back on track the next day, okay? So if you're just going out occasionally, just look for food that you like. Make sure you're not eating something you're allergic to. Make sure there's no glass in the food. Uh, I would say make sure that it, the plates are clean, they're not dirty. Um, maybe look at the reviews of the restaurant, make sure it's a high quality restaurant. But in terms of like what food you should get, like whatever the fuck you like, that's most important. That's gonna be a really good clip, Mitch. We're gonna put that one on Instagram as well, okay? Now, what about the person who is eating out several times a week, which frankly, like I do that. I did that even when I was on my most recent mini cut. I ate out several times a week, you know, newborn baby, uh, I'm tired, my wife is tired, ah, just order food, right, whatever. Or, but yeah, we actually didn't go out to eat, we just ordered food. Um, so number one is you want to look for restaurants that have generally uh, better options. And I use the word better and not healthier uh, very deliberately there, uh, mainly just because what I mean by better is better for your goals. And better for your goals is specifically something that's probably gonna be more nutrient dense, uh, probably something that's not gonna have a whole bunch of extra calories that aren't gonna make it easier to fit into your day. So. For example, uh, I mean, this is a little bit of a more expensive one and I don't expect everyone to do this, but for me, we have a sushi restaurant literally right across the street from us and it's very high quality sushi and I know I can get like a decent amount of sushi for relatively low calories, super nutrient dense, very high protein, it's gonna fill me up. So that was one of my go-tos, like a sushi restaurant is great. Now, when I'm on a cut versus when I'm regular, when I'm trying to lose weight, I don't eliminate the rice, but I will definitely get uh, less rice than if I wasn't um, wasn't trying to lose weight, right? Just because it's it's not because the rice is bad, it's not because the the carbs are bad. It's just because I need to reduce calories, and one way to do that is to remove a little bit of the rice. That's pretty much it. So looking for restaurants that have foods that are more in line with what you're trying to do and are gonna make your weight loss a little bit easier. Um, where restaurants can be a little bit more uh, customized to what you want is super helpful. So if you can go to a restaurant and you know, hey, you know, like hey, you can look at the restaurant and say, hey, I know uh, they're gonna cook this in a lot of butter or whatever it is and I wanna reduce the cooking oils so there aren't so many calories, I'm gonna ask them, hey, could you use some type of a spray? Or hey, could you steam this or something where you can have a little bit more say in what they're doing and, and trust that they're gonna do it. Um, one of the best things you can do is just look at the menu beforehand, especially nowadays, so many places have uh, calorie estimates of their meals. They're not always accurate, but at least a guesstimate is better than not knowing at all, right? It's a, a, better to have a general idea than not knowing at all. And I know for me personally, sometimes I'll look at a menu and be like, oh, that's probably super high calorie. And I'll look and I'm like, oh, that's actually not as bad. But something else will be like, oh, that's probably a really good choice. Like, I don't know, like a Cobb salad or whatever. Cobb salads are the cheeseburger of salads. They're like the double, they're like the quadruple cheeseburger of salads. Like they are notoriously, ridiculously high, high calorie. Not that you can't have them, but it is a surprise for a lot of people. So do a little bit of research beforehand. Have a couple of your favorite restaurants that you go to on a regular basis. Pick a few of your favorite meals that you know are gonna be higher protein, uh, relatively low calorie, uh, and they're gonna, they're gonna fill you up the most for the, the least amount. A very good uh, strategy that I use, if I, let's say I go out on a, on a business dinner or I'm just out with friends and family and I'm in the middle of a, of a cut for whatever it is and I need to I need to like hit my calories because who knows, maybe I'm cutting weight for a jujitsu competition or just like I've been super inconsistent and I just, I want to be on point for that dinner. What I'll do is as soon as I sit down and I order my meal, I'll say, could I also have a to-go box? So as soon as the meal starts, I get the to-go box, cut the meal in half and I put the other half in the to-go box, close it and I'm good to go because uh, number one is a lot of these meals are just fucking huge. They're way bigger than mean to. It's so easy just to be sitting down even when you're not hungry anymore and just still continue picking and eating even though you're not hungry. And so by taking it, putting it in the to-go box, having it out of sight, now you have a more appropriate portion there to begin with. So even if you don't do the, like, the, the choose the, the lower calorie option, just make it a more appropriate portion size from the very beginning, put that in the to-go box, and then you're good to go. So different situations for different goals and different people, but hopefully you found that helpful. And all that being said, let's get into the winners of the free month in the inner circle. So the three winners of the free month in the inner circle are number one, Hannah Putt. We've got 
Rebecca, and I know that's pretty ambiguous, but it just says Rebecca, so I replied to your comment. So Rebecca, you know who you are because I replied to your comment. And also Brakela Olds, and as you can see, there were six replies here. I also replied to this, but it's only Brakela who got the who got the free month. So if I replied and you're not Brakela, you don't get the free month, but Brakela you get the free month. Congratulations, Brakela, Rebecca, and Hannah. You all win a free month in the Inner Circle. Email me, jordan at sciatefitness.com, and I will set you up with your free month in the Inner Circle. So that's it for this video. Um, I feel like it was a pretty good video. Mitch, what do you think? Was it a good video? I liked it. Okay, cool. We think it was pretty good. We hope you enjoyed it as well. Uh, give Mitch a follow if you don't already on Instagram. Uh, if you don't follow the channel yet, please do. Hit the thumbs up button if you like the video. Subscribe if you don't already. And um, that's where I'm gonna end it. I'm just gonna stop rambling. This is already a long fucking video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful. And um, that's it. Have a wonderful day. I'm gonna go see my baby.